Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hey everybody, it's Alex Bennett, it is the Ramble, we go until midnight tonight, Eastern Time. Got something a little special for you uh, today, uh, uh, tonight, today, tonight, yesterday, anyway, today, tonight, whatever. Uh, How do I set this up? I I don't want to set it up too much because we talk about it in this interview. But I found somebody after all these years that years ago gave me a shove in the right direction that wound up letting me have a career for the better part of like, you know, 60 years. Uh, And uh, it is an opportunity for me to thank him. Uh, And his name is Ted Randall, and we found him living in, of all places, Victoria, British Columbia. And this was a guy who gave me a push in the right direction. I'll leave it there. Uh, I'll just uh, let you hear the interview and see where it goes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Randall. That face may not be familiar to a lot of our audience, uh, and it's not as familiar to me as it was years and years and years ago when I met this man. You don't remember meeting me, do you? Actually, I do not. Yeah. I used to go by the name Jerry Bennett, and I was a I was an aspiring broadcaster at that time. Well, at that time, I, I met so many people because I was traveling around the world. Yeah. And uh, meeting people all the time. That no, I have to apologize. Oh, I I, believe me, I didn't think you would. But let me let me tell you uh, uh, a little story about you know how I met up with you and what influence you had on me. And a lot of times we influence people and we never know we did. Um, You were on a station in San Francisco, which when I was a teenager, was all the rage. K-O-B-Y, Kobe. Kobe, yeah. Yeah. 1550. Yeah. This station, when it came on, was the first top 40 station in the Bay Area. When people described what it was going to be, most of us went, who would want to listen to that? And then it went on the air and we couldn't stop listening to it. And your, your involvement in that station was as a jock, and I think you were also, were you the program director? Yes, I was both. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it talk, uh, we'll get to your meeting up with me in a bit, but talk about those days at KOBY, because those were the days when Top 40 really started. I mean, it had never existed prior to that time. Gordon McClendon, Todd Storrs supposedly came up with the format, but they didn't do it in San Francisco. Explain how KOBY came to be. Well, KOBY came to be because, uh, let's see, I have to think of the owner now, Dave. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the same way with names these days. Uh, at any rate, uh, I was at a radio station in Omaha, Nebraska, when Todd Storrs had just recently started. Yeah. Uh, Top 40. Yeah. And I was intrigued because it was a daytime radio station, and it was number one by far of of all the radio stations in Omaha. I Mm -hmm. was at uh, Coil, K-O-I-L in Omaha, which later went to a Top 40 format uh, and so forth. But I left K-O-I-L and went to a radio station in Ottumwa, Iowa, which is way the hell and gone somewhere. At any rate, uh, it it was called K-L-E-E because the owner's name happened to be Lee something or other. And Lee was friends with Dave, it'll come to me in a second, who had several radio stations. And I wasn't to stay there. I was kind of learning the business and moving on. And I'd been at Omaha for a year and then K-L-E-E. And I moved on some more. And I remembered that 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 the radio station in uh, what the heck was it? It was uh, 
I was with Coyle. Yeah. At, at any rate, I remember Top 40 and Dave. And when I was in, when I was looking for a job, I found Dave had a radio station in Mississippi. And when I, and I went out to see him, and he hired me. <clears throat> I was in need of a job, and he hired me. While he was there, he was telling everybody that he was about to buy a radio station, KOBY, in San Francisco. I think it was called K-E-A-R before when... Yes, it was, as, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It. And I convinced him to let me go out to San Francisco. He mm. gave me $100 and said, you're on your own. <laughs> and I'll see you when you get there. And uh, it was, I mean, I was, I was pretty pushy and I was barely on the air in uh, Mississippi. WGVM. WGVM was mm. a radio station in, right. in Mississippi. At any rate, I got to San Francisco and uh, we all had to wait for a strike to get over. And uh, when we did, why, uh, we put together the radio station. But it, we really had, we had no, nobody who knew anything about Top 40, including Dave the owner and so we put it together and within i guess i guess it was about six months after we were on the air why i became program director but prior to that uh we had been on the air maybe oh i'd say a couple three months maybe at any around 13 weeks and we already were showing something like 50 percent of the radio audience wow it was incredible at that time yeah so we were there and uh uh, from there, I went on to do, uh, from that, I became program director, but then I was also invited to go out for a television show in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, got the, I got that show, it became the Ted Randall show at that time. And, uh, but on KOBY, why we, we had to use stage names, I was called Ted Rogers at that time. Mm -hmm. But made, made the switch over pretty nicely. So I was at, uh, at, I had the TV show for 19, it was 1958. Right. I remember it because I was a kid. Yeah. I was, I was 18 in 1958. Okay. Mm -hmm. And KOBY was, it was just this force of nature that happened. All yeah. of a sudden it just blew everything <laughs> off the map. Uh, and well, we knew, <clears throat> we knew we had to have 40, 40 top hits. Yeah. They've also had a radio station called KOSI in Denver. Mm -hmm. and we sort of patterned after that, but we didn't really have a pattern, and he didn't know what to do. We just basically made four, play, paid the top 40 popular records at the time. The idea was top 40 plus maybe like five up-and-comers plus a hit uh, a, a uh, hit well, one. Of, the oldies but, goodies, oldies but goodies had not arrived at it yet. <laughs> These things so, were in the uh, process of becoming oldies but goodies as you were playing yeah. them. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you're it. Why that was uh, that was a story. Well, that had but, to be that had I to be Ted on TV. When I went on TV, I left yeah. radio at that time. But a year later, uh, I didn't, wasn't happy with my contract and left TV. But just at that particular time, a new radio station in Oakland was coming up. K E W B. Applied for it, yeah, and I applied for it and got the job there. And KEWB was such a force of nature that it killed yes, KOBY. Were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and, and we we had a program director Chuck Blower from uh, right. Hollywood, right? Who had, who was was the overall program director of uh, of that and was of of the. Cruel Collier chain. Now, I don't remember at which point exactly it was that I met you, but I knew of you as being a force in the broadcasting business. And as a kid who was coming up, and I was working over KTIM in San Rafael. Uh, oh, yes. Doing part-time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I wanted radio in the worst way, and I figured the guy to talk to was Ted Randall. So I called you up, and I said, I'd like to talk to you and come over and see what advice you have for me. And you were nice enough to say, sure. And I remember wow. going over there and you counseling me on what I should do. And eventually I think you gave me a job. 
I don't know. I you were a, you had become <laughs> one of the earliest versions of a radio consultant. Well, I was. I created the broadcast consulting business. Yeah. Nobody else had done it before. Yeah. And and my first ra my first radio station there was KSRO in Santa Rosa. Right. But I went to KLAD in Klamath Falls, which I believe you also. Yes, I did. Consulted. That, sometime in there, I had 30 radio stations I was consulting with uh, on the West Coast. Yeah. But the fact that, so there were, you know, the fact that I could talk to somebody in the business and just bend their ear was a thrill for a kid at that age, you know. Uh, and uh, I was... I remember one piece of advice you gave me that still kind of resonates with me. I said to you, I, we were talking about music and I said, well, all my friends really like this kind of music. And you said to me, don't ever use that as a yardstick because you hang out with people who have the same interest and mentality that you do. You've got to think in terms of what the public wants. And well, I, that, yeah, and that I lasted recall. with me. That lasted with me to this day, to this conversation. Well, that that was one of the premises. I I think what worked with with my consulting radio stations was precisely that that I had to work. I had to worry about what would please the people, not what the people wanted, because the people seemed that that said. I mean, I talked with adults who said, "Oh, I'd never put that trash on my radio station." <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah. They said they would never put that trash on the radio station. I said, yeah, but most of your audience wants wants this trash that you won't put on. They said, oh. And finally they allowed <laughs> it and they were astounded. They were just astounded. Because it was it was what everybody – It's and it's a pretty much a premise with most businesses. If you talk about the clothing business, they'll say the same thing. It's not what you like yourself. It's immaterial. It's what the people will like. Yeah. And that piece of advice, oh, I mean, I'm sitting here today, how many years later, I don't even want to count them, remembering yeah. sitting in that office with you and you telling me that specific piece of information, you know. Well, it shows that my brains don't go very far. <laughs> <laughs> the right thing, I guess. <laughs> No, but it was it, it was terrific, and you know, for a kid my age and and wanting to go into the business, you gave me kind yeah. of a push in a in a certain direction, and I know you I don't didn't think you would remember me because I was such an insignificant part of your life at that point, but for me, you were a major part of my life. Isn't that something? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I was a decent friend to you at the time. <laughs> yeah, and I went on to have a career that lasted until about five years ago, and uh, wow. I was very successful in San Francisco, and I mm -hmm. was with Sirius XM, you know. And when I think about the about the influences that I've had in this business, there were a lot of them, but Ted Randall was one of them. You That's know? amazing. And and it's, so when I heard you, I were. Heard, and then I then I heard you were still alive. I went, my God, I got to talk to this guy, you know. Well, I'm getting up there in the years. They're uh, they're moving along pretty rapidly now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never thought you'd get this old. Otherwise, uh, no. That that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, do you mind me asking? I I always tell people how old I am. I'm 79, so I figure you're getting close 92. to 90. You're 92. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. You were in the radio business long after that, consulting and being on the air and so on. Uh, what, when you look at radio today, I tell people, you know, the radio business really doesn't exist anymore. It's right. You know. That's uh, correct. When you and I were in this business, uh, it, it was an exciting place to be. You know, we were able to offer something to people they couldn't get anywhere else within a relatively, relatively short uh, distance. Yeah. In other words, they, they didn't have to go 50 miles to go find something. It was on the on the radio and the radios were tuned in and uh, uh, they were able to find 
I mean, Todd Storrs was the one who who found it because yeah. he listened to uh, jukeboxes. Mm -hmm. but when well, the the legendary story that I got because in the later years I worked for Gordon McClendon. And Dave Siegel was the owner of a KOBY. Oh, by the okay, way. great. See, eventually you yeah. remember the names. Uh, I, um, uh, you know, I mean, I I just find that. Uh, um, all uh, the, 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 what's happening today is that uh, all the consolidation of the radio stations and the fact that all they care about is 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 keeping the station on the air. I mean, it's a t it's not the business it was where we were having a good time. As I say, I work for Gordon McClendon, and yes. and the legend had it that the way Top Forty was invented was they were he and Todd Stores after the war were sitting in a, a diner somewhere. Yeah, and they noticed Listen. that they noticed that the waitress kept going over to the jukebox and playing the same five songs over and over and over again. Yep. And one thing led to another, and they came up with top forty. Well, beyond Gordon McClendon, they gave Todd Storrs the idea, and he took his own. His father had the money so that he could, so he bought him the daytime radio station KOWH. Yeah. And when. Uh, he took a couple of a couple of his announcers over, and they were having lunch at another restaurant, and they were listening to the. They looked at the, the jukebox, and they found that they played the same forty records over and over. They made a list of it, mm -hmm. one by one by one, and they found out that those were the only records that people played, and so they tried it on the radio station, and immediately they became. Very, very well. They became the number one radio station at least during the day because they were a daytimer. I think I think it's an amazing it's an amazing story. It's an amazing history, and it's the yeah. thing that pretty well. It, what happened was radio was in trouble at the at the time you went yeah. with KOBY and so on. Yeah. It was in trouble because television existed and it was still trying to do what television could do better, uh, drama shows, comedy shows, yeah. whatever. And so this came along and literally hypoed the radio. It gave well, the, the radio music, business a whole new reason for existence. Forgive me for interrupting, but the no, only music ahead. available at that time was music of your life, which hadn't been invented yet. But it was the Glenn Miller a big band stuff, and that was all they had. That was a, 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 until Top 40. Well, I'll tell you what Top 40 did. It put my father out of work, because my father used to play in orchestras at the radio stations in San Francisco. And after a while, they didn't need the orchestras anymore. You know? Well, there are, a few things, there are a few things that time has told us, and one of the things uh, about Top 40 or Top 30 or whatever you want to call that type of thing I've discovered that a hit radio station like that has a life expectancy of about five years. Mm -hmm. The way it works, because somebody else comes along and improves it, changes it, or whatever have you. KOBY lasted maybe five years. KEWB lasted about five years. KYA came in and, and had its fling. And throughout all the various radio stations throughout the United States, they all had their five-year fling. Yeah. Now, I'm the only one that, that I know of who's ever said that. But I look back at all the radio stations, and I'm in touch with a, a ton of radio stations in Canada and, and other places. And the story always seems to be, well, it was AM. It wasn't AM that made the difference. It was the, it was the formula, the format. Right. I mean, I, took, I, took, I, I consulted with radio stations clear across Australia, and did the same thing with all those radio stations. At the time, I didn't know that I was going to have trouble after five years, but then I wasn't involved with them. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, uh, you, you say five years, but I worked at a station that lasted quite a while here in New York, which was WMCA. MCA was different, yes. Yes, it, it broke that five-year rule. I mean, it was, it, it was a sensation. And WABC yeah. came along and competed against it, but the two of them were going neck and neck. But it wasn't like they were being replaced by something else. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, I guess one of the rare pleasures that I had in my life was winding up working at WMCA because it was a legendary yeah. radio station. Yeah. 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 
And it, it probably was what, considering the size of New York City, yeah. it probably was a, a very, very special a special thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, I was working there with, uh, well, it was the end of Murray, the K's career. That was about his last yeah. New York station. Uh, yeah. But I was working with all the all the greats, you know, and I'm this, yeah. this yeah. kid coming into town. I, I was thrilled. It's absolutely thrilled. Um, what do you think as you, do you listen to radio anymore? I listen to Sirius XM. Uh-huh. I used to be on Sirius I XM. I channel that I've that I bother with. What's and that? I listen to it in the evenings because when I listen to it, I, I'm not competing. I'm no longer working <laughs> in radio. I'm just listening for what I want to listen to. Yeah. And what and, what, uh, cha what channel is that? Uh, I listen to channel 69. It's called Escape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They play, the old, they, play, they play good music versions of older hits. Yeah. I was... I, yeah, go ahead. I listen to those constantly and, and kind of go back to some of the things that I like and enjoy, but I don't, I'm not working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course not. You, you, I'm not working either. I got let go by Sirius XM after 10 years with them just about five mm -hmm. years ago, you know, but just, you well, I, I found that I, now in my studio, I'm a painter now and I've been painting by the way, I've been painting for, for but, 60 years. So, by the way, uh, I, I I looked at your stuff online, and yeah. it 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 took my breath away. I was amazed that you that you just didn't spend that doing that for all of your life. You no, know, I was I did as much of it as I could while I was uh, in radio. Yeah, but I was busy doing radio, so I was limited as to what I could do. Once I yeah. once I retired, then I went full bore into painting. Yeah, and I've been painting ever since. Uh, if if you had one, a major memory to take away from your career in broadcasting, is there a moment or a time that was that you would say was the time you you like to remember as being just a great moment for you? There, I would say there are two. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, I was uh, contacted by some people in Hawaii who knew about me, and because Hawaii was the United States, and they knew about me. And they were able to set up my uh, consulting in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I worked in Australia for uh, quite a number of years. That is, consulting and traveling back and forth. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm known in Australia as the one who brought uh, radio up to date. Uh, some, something like that. As the, I, I brought radio, popular music radio to Australia. Uh, and, and the other one is that I was in at a billboard conference and I was called by uh, the owner of radio station CHUM, Alan, uh, Alan uh, Rains again. At any rate, the, the owner asked if I'd have lunch with him when I did. Mm -hmm. And he said, we, we want to hire you. That was 1968. And they hired me to be the consultant for uh, not only Chum, but for their entire broadcasting group. And I had a two-year contract with them. That was It was a wonderful time. And I got to know Canada really, really well uh, after that. And and that, that's where you live now. Yeah, I've been here since late 1974. Did you be, ever become a citizen or you just... Uh... Yeah. Really? Yes, I'm all citizen. I have dual citizenship. Gee, you got that great health service now. You, you have that. It, it is the best that anybody's ever seen. Yeah. I would, if I had stayed in the United States, I'd be dead. <laughs> well, I didn't. I wouldn't have been able to afford all the operations that I've had. Yeah. I had bad legs and uh, some clogged arteries, and it would have cost. Uh, they, yeah. Oh, at least five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Didn't, and that, it didn't cost me anything. Yeah. Well, our signal is kind of freezing up on us now, unfortunately. Uh, but that's uh, uh, that's the nature of Skype. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 Ted, I I thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, this is an absolute pleasure, and I just wanted to tell you and thank you for sending me in the right direction in this business.
Well, if I had something good that I did for you, I'm, I'm most appreciative I had that opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Ted Randall. Thank you. Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is Gabnet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hey there. Okay, that was Ted Randall. I hope you enjoyed that. You know, um, uh, not the easiest interview to do because the guy is 92. And I hope that I'm as spry and as uh, alive and, and kicking as he is right now. Uh, but I, uh, I, I certainly, um, uh, it, 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 I hope you got something out of it. Because it really takes us back to the days when we had a thing called Top 40. And it was, uh, it was a sensation. And uh, he was one of the, he was, he was the pioneer in two ways. Uh, he was one of the first top 40 disc jockeys, one of the first top 40 program directors, and the first radio consultant. This, this is a group of people. My friend uh, Walter Sabo was a Walter, uh, radio consultant. These are people that went in, consulted radio stations, and made them better and made them uh, do well. And uh, he was the premier uh, uh, consultant of his time. And the reason he was is because he was the only one. And then a lot of other people said, hey, that's not a bad idea for a job. And they decided to become con consultants. Anyway, our lines are open. And uh, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, let me just clear a few things here so it looks nice and clean and good. See, this is what an empty... Uh, what an empty uh, non-panel looks like. That's, that's what it looks like. That's the screen. That's the Skype screen waiting for people to call. So uh, we're waiting for you out there to, to give us a call. Uh, and uh, we're uh, all you do, if you don't know how to do it, go to, uh, go to gabnet.net. You, you're not going to miss anything. You'll still see the, uh, the video because it plays there every night. Uh, and uh, that we're on. And then you go over to the right-hand side of the page, and there's a whole tutorial on how to, how to get Skype and how to be part of the citizen panel. And then you can join in and be part of our little group, which I'm waiting to, for it to start assembling. There we go. Here comes Charlie Wallace. Oh, Charlie saves my ass once again. Um, hold on a second. Uh, uh, is he going to... He, we got to wait for his picture to come in. You see, that thing whirls around. Look at it whirling. See, we there we go. There, there he is. Bravo. How are how are you this evening? Doing great. Yeah. That was an excellent interview. I loved it. Really? I you know yeah. I didn't I, I I didn't know how it would go over uh, to tell you the truth because as I said. You know, uh, to begin with, uh, certainly somebody like uh, Jack Bishop would be thrilled by that interview because he, he grew up with KOBY and with Ted Randall and so on on the radio and probably was one of the influences that got him kicked in the right direction. Uh, but yeah. to people who didn't live in San Francisco, you know, radio in those days was local, right? You know, you didn't have syndication. There wasn't some guy from New York doing a show that plays in San Francisco. All the stuff was local. And so each and every market had different local stars, different local radio people. And if you lived in San Francisco, you never heard of the disc jockeys that were on the air in New York. You didn't even know who they were, you know. So um, uh, it, that's why I, won I hope the interview was interesting because it is about one specific kind of market you know, and his involvement in it and then his involvement later on. But Yeah, but every city had top 40. We had WLS in Chicago. Yeah, but top 40. I remember when it first happened, you know, it wasn't a matter of just that, oh, well, hey, somebody said, oh, let's do some top 40. There was no top 40. Before that, radio was soap operas. It was variety shows. But television was coming in and ruining... Uh, in case people are wondering what's happening, if the Skype's adjusting itself. There we go. Hi, hi, Jeff. Uh, but uh, before that, you know, when I grew up with radio, I listened to, you know, 
uh, dramas and uh, entertainment yeah. shows and, and things like that. Well, when television came in, radio started having a hard time, and it didn't know what to do with itself. And Top 40 became the answer. You know, uh, hey, we'll, we'll play music. That's something a that television can't do. And it was they were right. Television couldn't do it. And so Top 40 came in. But what was interesting about Top 40 was they were playing the top 40 hits in that area, okay? So that your top 40 would be a combination of, say, Elvis Presley and Perry Como, and then something <laughs> yeah. by Nelson Riddle, and then Bill Haley and the Comets, and then, you know. It, in other words, it was all over the map, and in the top yeah. 40 you had all different kinds of music. And it wasn't until... And that still continued when we when we got over to like KEWB, which was a more sophisticated format of that. But uh, it wasn't until we hit the progressive radio when FM stations had to find a place in this world, and they started playing like you know all the records that the other stations wouldn't play. That we suddenly got a, a, a radio stations were nothing yeah. but rock and roll, nothing but uh, but you know <clears throat> progressive music and so on. Uh, but anyway, so that that was my that was Ted Randall, and and uh, I just it was just nice after uh, what is it? Well, this we're talking 1959. I probably met with him 1959, 1960, somewhere around there. How many years ago was that? 60 years. Wow. <laughs> is it 60 years almost? Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. 59 to, to 19 is 60 years. Yeah, well, I just decided that I would like to thank him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And, of course, he didn't remember me, and I didn't expect that he would. I was some kid who came over for a couple of hours one day in his life, and then he helped me get this job at K-Lad in Klamath Falls, and I did work for him. I did do, you know, production pieces for him. Uh but uh, it, it, I just, you know, it just was nice to be able to say thank you, you know. So you have him to be you ha you have him to be held responsible for this disaster <laughs> called Alex Bennett, you know. Uh, yes, uh, Jeff. Well, one thing that you mentioned mm -hmm. was that everything is local. Yeah. At that the time, but the one thing that I remember that was not local. Yeah. Was at night. Yeah, you could pick up stations. Well, That's no, right. no, but that that was because of what we call the sky wave, and uh, and that was only split. inherent. That was only inherent in AM radio. You couldn't get FM stations right. far away. Right. But what happened was, is there used to be at night there was a skip that would take place, and I could be, I, I would always I talk about this, that I would like to go to the top of Mount Tamalpais, which is the tallest mountain in the Bay Area. And I would go up to the top of it with my little car radio and put the antenna all the way up and then sit there and slowly go across the dial and yeah. see what I could hear. And I was picking up stuff, you know, east of the Mississippi. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, in fact, the skip, I remember the skip once on television. I'm sitting at home. I've got, you know, we had these big antennas that we put up, you know. And I'm sitting at home watching television, and all of a sudden, I'm getting Australia. <laughs> <laughs> that I never got. Because people don't realize thought. television. Here's, here's, here's where uh, television was. If you had your... Did you ever wonder why there was never a Channel 6? Did, when you had those dials, do you remember that yeah. it went from 5 and then went to 7? Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. there and there was no uh, there was no channel one, started at two, went to five, right. went yeah. to, then went from seven up to thirteen, uh, and the reason is that between channel five and channel six, um, or right, between channel five, five and, and seven, seven. seven, were all the FM stations. <laughs> oh. That's yeah. why it was blank there. Yeah, yeah. And that I think TV was actually an AM signal, and its audio was an FM signal. I, I, I may be wrong on that, though. If anybody wants to call up and argue with me, go right ahead, because I'm, I'm not that, you know, that smart on the subject. But I thought you'd like to know. 
Uh, but that, that, you know. But anyway, Ted was, they came into town, and all of a sudden there was a station that was only playing 40 records, plus maybe five others that were up-and-comers and the hit of the week, you know, the pick of the week. Uh, so maybe maybe 46, 47 uh, uh, records, and they played it over and over and over again. And you and we all thought, oh, what kind of format is that? That's going to die fast. We became addicted to it. I mean, yeah. it became such a sensation. As he said, in the ratings, they had at least 50% of the audience in, like th in the first three months that they were on the air. And that was the beginning of Top 40. So, you know, really very cool, very cool. And it was great to talk to the guy, you know. And also to, you know, let him get that plug in for Canadian health. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. His, uh, his line about, you know, if I were still in America, I'd be dead by now. You know, yes, uh, yes, Tom Imaguchi has joined us, and so is Rob Alfano. Hello, guys. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, was in. I really loved that interview. Uh, just when you were talking about, uh, about Pinky Eye Station at night, uh, he was talking about a Texas station being a daytime station. Mm -hmm. uh, that there were the FCC, there, some stations would actually have to go off the air. Yeah. At some oh, oh, yeah. I've worked a couple of them. I worked the first one I ever worked, KTIM in San Rafael, was what we called a daytimer. And that, and it, it went off at sunset. So, so like in the middle of summer, we didn't go off till like a quarter of nine. But, it, but in the middle of winter, we were going off at four forty-five. You know, and <laughs> yeah. and then the same thing was true of KLAD in Klamath Falls. I believe it was a daytimer. But that, those were the only two daytimers I ever worked. The last when I was a teenager in the East Coast, uh, I used to listen to a classical music station at uh, in Bryn Mawr in PA. And uh, they would actually go off the air at four thirty in the afternoon <laughs> because that was yeah. sunset. Well, that, that it was that, four, I, more particularly, if I remember correctly, it was four forty-five. But it it could be that where you were it was four thirty. Well, yeah, yeah, where we where it was in Pennsylvania, it was yeah. four thirty. Yeah, there was a station in San Francisco called KJBS. And it had a very strange situation. See, the reason why a lot of these stations had to go off at sunset was because they were protecting the signal of what it was, were called clear channel stations or stations that had more power that at night, because of that skip we talked about, could get interrupted by just a local station. And, and, and you know, like, for instance, KTIM in San Rafael was only 1,000 watts. But if we were allowed to stay on at night, we could knock out. We were protecting somebody mm -hmm. in, I think, Seattle. We could knock out some of their signal. And that mm -hmm. was one of the reasons the FCC was formed in the first place is because when radio first started, everybody started jumping on everybody else's frequencies, trying to knock them off. And so when the FCC came into power, they started becoming the policemen of the airwaves. And so some of these stations became, as you say, daytimers. But this thing, KJBS, it had to go off. It was 50,000 watts during the day. And it had to go off at uh, sunset. And then it could come back again at 10 o'clock at night with 1,000 watts of power. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the strangest, strangest thing I ever heard of in my life. By the way, folks, we're going to be off for the next four hours. But... During the summer, they were only off for like an hour and 15 minutes. It was very strange. Very strange. Uh, you remember all this, Rob, at all? Yeah. Are there still, day, would, are there still, I, are there still day timers? Yeah, sure there are. Really? Yeah, they're like uh, WHLI on Long Island is a day timer. Mm -hmm. 1100. Yeah. Um, I worked. I never worked at a day timer. I worked at stations, a couple of them that would power down at sunset. Mm. We go from ten thousand watts daytime. The, well, the first station yes, I worked yes. at was ten thousand watts daytime, five thousand nighttime. And then I worked at a one thousand daytime that went down to five hundred at night. I'll tell you wow. because because of that factor. That factor may have played into my career. Let me explain something to you. If you had a station that was, uh, uh, it had to, there were two kinds of stations. There were non-directional, in which the signal just went 
from the transmitter and then around and around and around as far out as it could go. And then there was another kind called directional. And they had a signal that was direct. Multiple towers. Yeah, and it would go in one direction, again, to protect another radio station. Well, in order to work at a uh, directional radio station and at one of those stations where they changed power during the day to the night, you had to have a first-class operator's license. Oh, not when I was... From the FCC. Well, when I wow. started out in this business, you had to. So I was I I didn't have one. I had a third class. Third class. If you just went down to the FCC and said I want a third class license, they mailed you a card and you cut it out of the card and put it in your wallet. Okay, it was one of those deals. Uh, but if you wanted a first class license, you had to take this test of stuff that. Come on. I, uh, uh, what they did is certain people had cram schools, and they would just cram the information into people, and they didn't know what they were learning, but they were able to go down and pass the test. And so they had themselves had a first-class license. Take, I had to get a third-class uh, license, brought what they call broadcast-endorsed. So it was a test to get that in order when I first started in broadcasting. Okay, okay. What, what, what did the test ask? Uh, you had to know how to do the indirect method of of uh, of calculating the transmitter um, power and such. Yeah, the, you know there was the direct and the indirect method. Okay, but the, the, the that was a that was probably a accommodation to kind of replace first class. You know, first class was for chief engineers. If you wanted to yeah. be chief engineer, oh yeah, you had to have class. a first class license. But anyway. I never got a first class license. I just didn't want to have to go through it. I remember once I bought all the books, the, the cram books, and I just, it just, I couldn't do it. It was nuts. And I made a decision in my life. And I, my decision was if I find a, st I'm going to be so good in this business that if I find a station where I have to, ha where somebody has to have a first class license in order to operate the station, they'll have somebody on staff around while I'm doing my show. To watch the transmitter. Oh, well, there you go. And therefore, <laughs> I will not get jobs just because I've got a first class license. I'll get the job because they think I'm really good. They want me and they're willing to keep somebody around to watch the transmitter for me. Uh, and that's that's what uh, that was a that's probably is one of the things that contributed to my success in my career. But because, you've gotten you had you've done meter readings and all that, right? Well, I you, when I had the third class restricted, you had to do meter readings. You had to do meter, yeah. meter readings every hour. I right. didn't know what well, the, it was every two hours when I started. yeah. Well, I didn't know what the fuck they meant. I just <laughs> wrote them down, <laughs> or or if it was nighttime and I knew that the FCC wasn't going to come knocking on the door. Uh, I would just wait till the end of the shift and just fill the whole thing out and make it all. <laughs> oh, up. Most people would do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, you really didn't take yeah. that too seriously. But you know, I often felt that it was a in a in a business that to me was uh, show business. Okay, and and uh, what kind of show could you do? The fact that you had to have a license in order to do it just seemed wrong to me. You know, and so I never got a license, and I never had a problem getting a job. They said, "Oh well, then we'll find somebody around here. Bob's got a first-class license, and he's here uh, during those hours. He'll watch over the transmitter for you." Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. Well, I have an idea. Uh, as a non-radio person, just a listener. Yeah. Uh, I'll bounce this off and see what you think. You, you know, you talk about uh, the changes made radio by television. I think there was an equal amount of changes made radio by by cars. The fact that that people uh, only listened to the radio when they were in the car. Well, I will take it. I will take it a step further. Uh, do you know? Do you know what? There's one th car radio certainly changed the dynamic of radio because it changed the amount of radio you would be listening to, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, so that if uh, the ratings came out, they would, you know, you would tell them what you listened to when you were in the car. So that, that did change it to a certain extent, but I'll tell you what kind of really changed it. You remember in the old days you had a radio in the car and how did you tune it? You had a tuning knob, right? And you yeah. went from station to station to station to station. Well, 
One day, one manufacturer decided they would put buttons in so you could pre-tune the stations to yeah. the stations you liked. And so let's say you, there's a new radio station in town. You're never going to know it because it isn't one of your buttons. Mm -hmm. And so the preset became a real problem for radio stations that wanted to put themselves on the map. You know, somebody's got their... Uh, I, I, wait a minute, hold on a second. I know what I'll do. I'll just kill this and that. That, Well, yeah, that stopped it, kind of. Yeah, okay. Getting a little slap back. Very rare these days. Um, I was going to mention push buttons. What? I was going to mention push, push buttons uh, in car radios. Yeah. yeah. Also changing the way people listen to the radio. Yep. yep. Definitely. <laughs> So you know, somebody, how are we getting a, how are we getting slap back? And that I don't understand. We haven't had it for a while. Uh, now we're okay. All right. Uh, so I mean that 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 did change things, Be, and it made it more difficult for you if you were a new station. Maybe you just change formats and you really wanted people to listen to you. You'd have to advertise. You'd have to do stuff to make people change their preset. And you know there are only five of them, maybe. So you, you, yeah. you know, uh, and and uh, so because in the old days, if people were listening to the radio and they dial down, they were tuning down. They would hear something they like, and they would stop there. Yeah. You know, so what you had to do was do something which would make them stop as they went down the dial. There were several ways people stations did that. One of them was. They made their station, I had one, a couple of stations I worked at, that made their station, and I don't know if you remember this, Rob, distinctive by putting an echo behind it all the time, like this. Oh, oh absolutely. And, and, yeah, and whenever you would talk, you know, and every, so and when you were going by that station and you heard that reverb or that slight echo, and it was just, it was very minor, it was very low. Uh, it gave the station a distinctive sound. So, well, I, I mean, I've worked at stations sure. where we had. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Shut up, Echo. What? I've I've worked at stations where we've had reverb. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the in the nineties, you know, the sixties were in, and I worked at an oldie station. Recreated the sound of. Those stations that had the top 40 stations that ran the reverb. Yeah. So uh, that was one way you made yourself sound distinctive from the other station. Yes, uh, 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 Jeff? Yeah, I think that was, uh, what, WABC? Did that yeah. WABC they had did. it. Yes, they did. Yep. Yeah, it wasn't It wasn't like a, a prominent echo. It was just oh, there. It was pretty prominent on WABC. Oh, really? Oh, okay. oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, you know, there, I'll tell you, there, there. What what one of the things that hurt, kind of hurt radio, was, and I don't know if you if you know what I'm talking about when I talk about audio processing. Rob does, but uh, in the old days with FM, if you ever heard a FM radio station in the early days, you never heard such a clean sound in your life. It was just yeah. incredible. That's why a lot of classical stations and jazz stations decided to go on FM because they could play the. And you, when you heard FM, you just went, now, boy, compared to AM, this is just incredible. Well, what happened was is they decided that some of these stations decided to start processing their sound. So the sound you get on FM stations today is nothing like FM can sound. Because it's being it's being compressed and it's being expanded, and they do all kinds of things with it. And it's, it's loud, and then they, they do that because they want to be the loudest thing on the dial. Yeah, yeah. So and there's there's the, you know I worked at a station in the '90s. It was an oldie station on Long Island, mm -hmm. and we sounded gorgeous, but we were the lowest thing on the dial, but we sounded gorgeous. The chief engineer loved what you could do with FM to make it sound spacious and beautiful, great stereo separation, especially with some of the oldies we were playing. It was beautiful, and we all hated it. 
<laughs> we all hated it because we were the lowest thing on the dial. We weren't punching through. We were a brand new station, brand new frequencies that went on the air in 1992. And we were trying to be heard. And we eventually, the, uh, the jocks and the program director eventually overruled the chief engineer. And we brought in one of our jocks who was also, who, who was into audio processing as a sideline. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we petitioned to get him to go in there and to tweak the equipment to make it sound like all the other stations. But he was really pissed at us for that, the chief. It really? He was like, oh, you ruined the sound of the station. Yeah, but we want to be heard. Yep. We want to be loud. Yep. We want to stand out. Yeah, but so I, I remember the first time I ever heard FM, I was just, it was astounding. It was just it astounding. Is. Yeah, it is, but nobody does that because they want to be heard. But I'll tell you what's happened. You know, I mean, here, here to begin with, I've, I've been always been arguing that as years have gone on, the ears of the American public have become numb. Yes. Uh, that they can't hear good sound. Because what they're putting up with now, I mean, look at what they're putting up with on the Internet. And they think that's that's good, solid sound. Or what they're listening to on their iPhone. You know, that, oh, this is a great thing, this iPhone deal. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I can listen to my music. But what you're getting there is nothing like the fidelity you should be getting. But but everybody's dumbed down their expectations of sound. Audio files, you know, back in the 60s when stereo first came out, and you had guys who would go out and spend a ton of money on, you know, like Macintosh amplifiers and mm -hmm. expensive high-end speakers. And they were worried about frequency response and stereo separation and all that. Today, nobody gives a rat's ass about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. It's terrible. But you know, what the hell? I mean, those Vernon Nunn is online, but he's not, uh, he's not, uh, not attempting to call in. That's strange. But I do have an animation of a thing, a thumb going, giving the high. Are you getting that too with Vernon? Are you seeing Vernon's name up there? I am. And it's got like, you know, he's got like the, the thumb up. Anyway. So, uh, you know, I mean, what, what interested me with, with Ted was that, you know, this was a guy who was there when this stuff started. You know, you, you didn't... I always loved the fact, I always felt really bad that I, I wasn't there at the beginning for that. Uh, I, I'm, I was always sad I was never there for the beginning of television. Because w what happened was, is those early people could define what the medium was going to be. Yeah. Uh, and I so agree with you. And everything they did defined it. You know, and... Um, uh, the internet, to a certain extent, I felt maybe I somewhat helped define in a way, but that that was about it. Oh, here comes Vernon. Um, let me see here. Yeah, there's Vernon. There's a picture of Vernon's dog, and then uh, in any moment, a picture of Vernon should appear. Uh, I think, if it <laughs> works. Okay, well, we'll just let him spin for a while. Eventually, he'll pop in. Yeah. <laughs> Hello there. You there, Vernon? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, what, what are you doing? Are you doing this on your phone or something? Or oh, there you there go. Is. There he is. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, it's the new lounging way of doing this show. We've got, we've got. <laughs> look, look, we've got, we've got, uh, we've got uh, 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 Rob uh, looking really comfy, and Josh looking real comfy, and Tom's almost lying. Are you lying down, Tom? I'm resting against the wall. You're resting bed. against the wall. Okay. And and uh, uh, so it's only Charlie, I, and Jeff who are, are actually not not lying down. Old school. Yeah. We don't uh, want to fall, old fall school. Asleep. Yeah. But, um, you know, so, I mean, I would have loved to have been there at the very beginning of all of this and helped define it and help mold it, you know. And, and the one thing that I liked about cable television when cable came along, that was my chance to be in on the beginning of something. And that gave me a chance to define the, uh, the, uh, the medium. Of course, what I defined it with was tits and ass. But that's, you know, hey, <laughs> what did it become? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, come on. Nothing the wrong with that. Bad thing. You Somebody know, had to do it. I remember, I remember time, time Life, who owned Manhattan Cable, <laughs> 
uh, pulled Midnight Blue off the air because we were just an abomination to them. They didn't like the fact that they were going to be defined by this sex show, and they didn't think it was good for time life to be that way. And even though by law they had to keep our show on the air, they pulled us off anyway. Well, later on, Time Life uh, owned a thing called HBO. In fact, they had HBO when we were doing cable. What did HBO become? Do you ever see that ad I used to run on my old show, the TV thing, that somebody made up going, "It's hey, Mom, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this show, and then he kisses me, and I kiss him, and then we have sex, and she goes, you're doing porn? Oh, no, Mom, it's not porn. It's HBO. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the whole the whole ad is at the end. It's not porn. It's HBO, uh, and 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 pretty much, Time Life went into the porn business. They just wanted to get us out of it so they'd have a free reign, you know. But uh, we got back on the air, so fuck them, you know. But uh, anyway, yes, uh, uh, Vernon, the restful Vernon. Look at him. He just looks like I want to go to sleep now. Goodbye. <laughs> I heard you talking earlier about uh, the cable channels or the television channels, and the reason that Channel One was never assigned was because the picture quality sucked and there was too much static. But by that time, enough TV stations had been assigned that they did not re-assign uh, the channel numbers. Right. So they started at Channel Two, and then am I right? They went to Channel Five, and then they skipped Five, or maybe they was skipped there a Six. six? I think maybe there was a six. They skipped six. They skipped six because it, they either skipped six or between five and six were all the exactly. FM channels. That's right. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and you're and, correct. And I think. No, uh, wait a minute. Picture, I think, um, was wait a minute. One at a time. Uh, first Rob and then Vernon. Yeah. I think uh, television audio was always FM. Yeah. Uh, yes. What were you going to say, Vernon? And then over to Tom. Yes, Vernon. Yeah, the picture was amplitude modulated and the sound was frequency modulated. And then when color television came along, they added a subcarrier of three and a half megahertz to send the color picture. Wow. All right. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Tom. So I remember living in two cities that had a TV channel six locally, mm -hmm. uh, both Philadelphia and, and uh, San Diego. I remember we could tune are um, on the FM radio. If we tuned far enough to the, you know, to the to the low part, you could actually pick up the audio for the for channel six. Okay, so there was a six, but I think it was between. I think it was between either. Maybe it was six and seven. Uh, it, Vernon, you you should know a little bit about this. Between six and seven were the FM bands. I think that's right. I'd have yeah. to do some okay. research to confirm it. Yeah. And then they only had 12 channels, of course, the top one being 13, and that was it. And we didn't go higher till they brought in cable. Well, then we got UHF. UHF. Then they got UHF, UHF. and then you got your 14, 15, 16, whatever. That's when you get all the great Spanish uh, <laughs> yes. soap operas. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, when they first started UHF, nobody watched it at all. Yeah, you got bullfights. In fact, wasn't that what Ted Turner did? He bought his station yeah. down in a Atlanta and it was a UHF and nobody wanted to watch it so he decided he he found this thing called the satellite nobody was using it and he started distributing it was called the uh, super station mm -hmm. and and he ran his station out of there nobody watched it over the air but you know he became a, a force to be reckoned with and today it still exists it's what it's TBS uh and uh, so that was that was uh, how that uh, that came to be. But UHF, I forgot about UHF altogether. <laughs> Ultra high frequency. It didn't didn't go as far, did it? It was a little harder to pick up. Remember, you had the dial that you would spin and spin and spin, and you would have to like it was more like a radio dial. It didn't click the way the way uh, a television dial did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but well, the other thing you have to remember is that uh, radio waves tend to act more like light waves as they go up in frequency. So a UHF station would tend not to go as far unless they increase the power. Right. 
Right. Uh, uh, um, uh, also, in radio, in radio, the stations up at the higher end of the dial uh, didn't have to have huge amounts of power. Uh, five five thousand watts at five sixty was yeah. more powerful than fifty thousand watts at fifteen ten. Am I right again, Vernon? Because Vernon's Vernon's the uh, yep. dots and dashes guy here. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, are we boring everybody with this? Uh, I don't think so. They're they're actually we were getting some nice size uh, numbers here. Uh, I I just uh, you know I so what a wonderful. We One, keep hearing oh more and more about AM stations shutting down. The only thing that's going to be left are the clear channels. Yeah. So for all of you who are just joining us and don't know what we're talking about, if you get a chance uh, when we're off here or tomorrow, uh, come listen to the rerun of this show anywhere in the number of places that you can get it. In the first half hour, I talked with Ted Randall, who was like a pioneer, basically. You know, and I, I would love to talk to a lot of these pioneers. Only he's the only one that's alive. You know, I I don't I, I don't know where most of these other people are. Um, uh, but anyway, so that's that. So anyway, every oh yes, Tom. I'm just saying, um, you know, talking about things that are going out of business on the local news site. They they had a story that. There is one blockbuster video yes. of the whole, yes. whole world. It's in Oregon. It's in Oregon, and it, it's it's been there for quite a while. It was the because they closed the last one down in India. I think it was Australia. Australia, Australia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's the only blockbuster left, and it does a pretty good business because people just find it anachronistic. <laughs> you know, they love it. I was thinking about it. You know, I really wish I could rent DVDs because you know, as as uh, as predominant as Netflix is, and as much stuff as Netflix has on it, it can't have the selection of movies that I want. So that I say, you know, really, what I'd like to do is go down and get the the Bad Lieutenant. You know. Uh, and I can't find. You couldn't find the Bad Lieutenant on Netflix right now. Because it doesn't have, it's not like tens of thousands of, of videos. But you can you can still order from Netflix. Do you know that? Mm, yeah. Yeah. They still have that service. So, I I, I wonder I, I wonder if how many people use it. I do. Do you really? Yeah. How much does it cost? Um. Well, I have both uh, streaming and DVDs, so it's twenty bucks a month. Oh, okay. So the, you pay an extra little bit of money to be able to order, and what can you order one at a time? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's the last one you ordered? I got one coming. Uh, what's the last one I watched? Um, what was that one with uh, about stolen identity or something? Uh, with Jason Bateman and, and uh, Melissa McCarthy. That's the last one I watched yesterday. Oh, uh, really? And, and, <laughs> and, but you can't get another one until you send the other one back and they get it, right? Yeah, they got it today, and, and they're sending me another one out that I'll get tomorrow. So how fast does it take to get back to them? It's a day. I mean, uh, every three days I get a video because mm -hmm. I send one. They get it the next day. They send theirs out, and I get it the day after that. What I'm thinking of is how do you find where the late closest post office box is? Because quite frankly, I don't think a lot of us know where uh, the closest post office box is anymore. <laughs> I mean, I uh, I think mine's on the corner, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, yes, Tom. Well, I know where my post office is. It's just a few blocks away. That's but amazing. I also get um, I also get uh, DVDs from the library. So I frequently will, will watch a DVD for the library. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, free. Of course. All of a sudden, I'm <laughs> oh, getting, wow. I'm getting, I'm getting a slap back again. Hold on a second, folks. I don't know what, uh, what how, how that's happening, but anyway. 
So uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. What else is uh, there to talk about? Well, um, Paul Manafort. Uh, how do you feel about the fact that Paul Manafort's going to jail, but only for 49, what is it, 40, 47. 47 months, which makes it uh, what? How many How many years is that? Three, three Almost years. Four. Almost, Almost four, four years. years. Almost four. four years. Almost four years. And uh, he gets time off for time already served. Yes. So it's closer to three years. Okay. And he'll probably, with good behavior, be out in, yeah. in about two weeks. So yeah. yeah, that's just for the Virginia charges, though. That's that doesn't count. Yeah. What's going to happen in D.C.? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, but it, it, you know, uh, do you feel he got enough time? No, no. What? How, how many years should he have? Uh, yes, Tom. Well, I'm just wondering if um, part of the consideration is the fact that he's got more charges to to serve on. And I'm wondering if they're going to really, these other charges or these other, other uh, you know, guilt pleas are, are going to end up with even longer series, periods of time in jail. He might end up, as they say, in, in, in jail for the rest of his life. Who knows? Well, the, in the state charges, they, they, uh, these weren't state charges, were they? These were all federal charges, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. The the state has yet to come in. The Southern District of New York, for instance, with stuff against him. Uh, is Southern District of New York have stuff against him? I think so. I'm not sure. But the fact is that if you can get a state to go after him, the president can't pardon him. He only has pardon abilities where, uh, uh, where uh, uh, the federal government is concerned, where federal is concerned uh you know and he's too busy working on a pardon for cone isn't he uh <laughs> not anymore oh boy you know i mean i think the you know the stupidest thing that donald trump ever did wasn't keeping cone close to him you know and keeping him happy because this was the guy you know these guys who were who who was john dean remember john dean Years ago, mm -hmm. with uh, with Watergate, John Dean was what to the president? He was the president's yep. lawyer. So these guys, the lawyers, know everything, you know. Uh, and what they yeah, don't know, they strongly it. suspect. So anyway, so uh, Manafort uh, got uh, uh, some time, uh, and uh, who knows how much of that time he's going to serve? I have no idea. You know, I guess, you know, uh, it could, well, here comes Patrick. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Hello. Uh, he hello to Patrick. Come in, Patrick. There you are. There, there. There's the kid. Yeah. How you doing? Um, pretty well. I uh, would have been on sooner, except... Uh, on the phone with family with some bullshit and then took my shower, which did fine. And then I brewed myself a nice hot cup of water. I forgot to put the coffee in the fucking machine. Me <laughs> <laughs> now. Do, do you use the K cups? No, I've got a, a small uh, one cup machine. Oh, really? And then I a 12 cup machine when I have people over. So, this is just a one cup, and I filled it up, and I went and I was doing something else, and I remember Yeah. And it turned out that I had a nice hot cup of water. So, so why do you, why don't you do K cups? Uh, I don't have a machine. That that's kind of on yeah. my list. Perhaps for my birthday. Yeah. My family will be nice enough. I I just you know I I, I find it's just convenient you know and i don't even use the k cups what i do is i get the ground coffee and then i get the the refillable k cups yeah. and and i fill them up and and i've got this little scooper that puts exact amount into the into the thing and you close it up and you put it in and you know the only thing the only hassle is you have to wash it out every time but uh you don't get that plastic taste which you can get supposedly from the uh, from that, but but it, you know it's it brews a fine cup of coffee. 
fine cup of coffee. Well, I made a fine cup of hot water. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what? So what did you think about Paul Manafort only getting forty-seven? Forty-seven months? Is that it? Am I got it right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't catch any of the news today. Oh, okay. I, I All right. Well, uh, do you have any opinion on R. Kelly? Did you see him implode? <laughs> yeah, I saw his implosion. Look, after the whole Justice Smollett thing mm -hmm. and how it looked sincere. Yeah. I'm not sure if I buy R. Kelly's sincerity. I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah, well, there was... It was the same shit. It was, you know, uh, why why would I, uh, you know, manufacture a crime that could, you know, create more racism, blah, 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 than it turns out he did. And then R. Kelly, I didn't do this, I didn't... I'm just waiting for it to come out that he did it, and then... Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I would say that if I were a betting man, I, I wouldn't bet that he didn't do it. Okay, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm willing to. I'm withholding judgment because I saw that, and all I saw was Jesse Smollett sort of crying in front of her, and I'm like, eh, no, I, I'm not going to buy. It. Yeah. Right. Well, I, uh, um, uh, um, I, it was it was something to watch. Uh, I watched the interview with him, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't terrible. I mean, it, you know, I mean, I, I, but what I didn't like, I'll tell you what I didn't like is the morning host, the female host, not uh, Oprah's friend, but the other one, was like, oh, isn't it terrible what he did to all those women? You know, and she goes into this whole waxing poetic about how women are vilified and hurt and so. And I'm going, shut the fuck up. The guy isn't even guilty yet for crying out loud, you know? And here you have a national platform as a news person, and you're giving your opinion of what really happened. What, how's that news? And this woman, I think it's Nora O'Donnell, is going to be taking over the CBS Evening News. <laughs> you really got to be that bad to be the head of the CBS Evening News. The story that got me today, and I, I don't know if, if any of you followed this, our Congress, because, you know, they do things that are really proactive, our Congress, today uh, is in the process of passing a bill against hate. Now, what I found so incredibly funny about this was, well, what is the alternative a bill for hate i mean how low have we gone that they feel they need to pass a law against hate uh or pass a resolution it's just not even a law it's a resolution against hate isn't everybody pretty much against hate yes tom are you for hate vernon yes yes tom I'd say, you know, the background of that uh, was that uh, the, the congresswoman was... The Muslim? Yeah. Wait a minute, your microphone, is somehow you've lost your microphone, or it's not... All, all of a sudden, we're not getting sound from you. Sound. Hmm. You getting anybody else? Yeah, I'm getting everybody else, yeah. Yeah, I, I get everybody else, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we're on mute. Tom, are you muted? I don't know. He doesn't say he's muted. All of a sudden, his sound, wanted, it's, um, oh, it's almost yeah. like his microphone fell or something like that. I was hearing it, it just started to fade. No, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. Hmm. Uh, maybe he needs to hang and call up again. Yeah, maybe you need to hang up and call again, Tom. That might be good. Yeah. There I could read his lip there. He said, okay, all right. Huh? Yeah. I, I could read his lip. He said, yeah. okay, I'll Oh, okay, so. good. Well, I'm glad we have a lip reader. Um, uh, thought, no, but I, it, just, it would just also, seem bizarre to me to say Congress is going to pass a resolution against hate. And it was all based on the fact that they had this Muslim congresswoman who made what they considered anti-Semitic remarks. And... Uh, 
I, I I saw those remarks, and I'm a Jew, and I didn't find them particularly anti-Semitic. I found them pro-Muslim. Are you there, Tom? Can you hear us now? No, no, your microphone oh, still isn't. Can't hear you. Your yeah, mic. Yeah. Go into your microphone settings in your Skype and take a look there. Maybe it may have some reason it, that. Uh, He's showing mute on my screen. He's showing mute? You're muted. Yeah. You're muted, Tom, somebody says. Well, it doesn't show that on mine. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, off and on. Here we go. Oh, no. it, it's off now on the screen, but you're still muted. Uh, well, I, I have no idea what that's about. Well, I I don't I don't well I don't know. Well, let's get let's move on with the program anyway, and let Tom try and figure out what it is. Uh, but uh, Tom, I got an idea. Do you know where your microphone is? It's in the is it in the screen? Tom, can you hear me? Nod your head if you can hear me. Yeah. Do you have a microphone in the screen? Is that where it is? Okay. Why don't you put why don't you tap on it and see if we get any sound at all? Huh? Nah. Nah. I don't know. It did change a little bit. I don't know what happened. But. It gradually faded out. <coughs> no. 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 No, no, no. Who knows? Maybe it died. Oh, well, I, I, you know, I mean, it, it could be that something. Ha I mean, I, 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 I'm not there, so I can't figure it out for him. But you know. Okay, hang oh, up. There you are. There you hey. were there. He was there. <laughs> he was there. He he Just before he hung up, he was there. You were there, Tom. Call back. Tom, yeah. call back. Call back, Tom. <laughs> Please call back. <laughs> oh boy. Wait a minute, let me, let me see here. Let me, let me, let me, let me call him using Skype and see if he picks up. Let's see if he picks up. Anyway, I, I just don't like it when we have to bring the show to a standstill because of some technical problem. Uh, hello, Tom, are you there? No, I guess he's not there. I guess not. Oh, well. Anyway, anyway. Uh, what else? What else is happening? God, I, 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 I oh. huh? Yes. You talk about the Muslim stuff. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, did you did you hear some of the stuff she said? Did you read any yeah, of it? You know, I heard so much more complaining with very little about what she actually said. Well, that's that was the part that got me. Is I didn't know exactly what she said. So how am I as a Jew supposed to be upset by it? Because Chuck Schumer, who is a Jew, says it's upsetting. You know, uh, 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 you know. Um, I my feeling is is that what I what I could see that she said, it had to do with uh, the fact that the United States gives uh, Israel preference, and that she said follow the money, and and the fact is there is a lot of money at stake there as well. Uh, yes, um, uh, Charles. Um. Yeah, all, all she said was that she didn't want to pledge allegiance to the right-wing uh, government of Netanyahu. She didn't say anything about Jews. Is that what she said? <laughs> yeah. So she, how is that anti-Semitic? Yeah. God, she, I, I'm saying... She didn't even say she hated Israel. She just hated that particular government. Well, now I know how black people feel when some white guy <laughs> says that's offensive to the black people. <laughs> you know? Don't don't go out speaking for me. I'll decide whether it's anti-Semitic or not. And by the way, from a technical standpoint, she can't be anti-Semitic because she is Semitic. Is Semitic. <laughs> so, right. you know. But, I mean, the fact that they pass a, a, a resolution against hate, well, come on. Isn't that a given? I mean, do you have to pass a resolution on that? Waste you know. of time. By the way, uh, um, um, uh, um, Josh, you've been a little quiet tonight. Uh, yeah, I guess I have. <laughs> <laughs> Any opinion about this uh, this uh, whole brouhaha that's going on because some Muslim congresswoman wrote some tweets? <clears throat> well, I, 
<clears throat> I never heard what uh, I never heard what she said, and uh, so I, I still haven't heard it. Uh, I just kind of read headlines, et cetera, about her saying things about you know Jews, which sounds like that probably was misleading. Yeah, I'm sure they only passed a resolution just so that they can. You know, try to say next time they're admonishing some Republican for some similar act, they can say, well, you know, we admonished our own, you know, you guys need to do the same. And then, so that's basically the motivation behind that. And then last of all, wait a minute, wait a minute, you uh, mean it isn't because they care about Jews? No, I oh, okay. not they care about Jews. Oh, God, I thought and, for uh, a moment so somebody now. cared about Jews, you know. Right. <laughs> And uh, isn't fucking isn't Netanyahu going to go to prison here maybe pretty soon anyway? Yeah, it and, looks like it. It looks like it. They're, know, they're much better at getting their officials in prison than we are. Yeah, fuck that. Fuck yeah. that guy. I don't care about fucking Netanyahu. I, <laughs> I don't think I have disliked anybody more than I dislike Netanyahu. Right. You know, I find him a totally despicable human being. Uh, and I'm not surprised that he was caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Okay. Uh, in fact, so Jews are not the high and mighty fucking whitewashed people that apparently we're all supposed to believe they are. They they commit crimes too. Uh, it's been known to happen. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. No, I'm just uh, curious. But but here's here's the deal. Uh, did I just offend some Jews? I, I don't no, know. No, no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you something. No, look, I've never been. <laughs> listen, I've, I've I've never been particularly pro-Israel myself, you know, uh, and I'm Jewish uh, because I don't consider Israel to be Jewish. I consider it to be Israel, <laughs> and as such, you have to treat it as a political entity. You have to treat it as a nation, not as a religion. Because God forbid, what would happen if tomorrow Israel decided to attack the United States? Do they then round up every Jew in America and put us in some camp somewhere like they did with the Japanese? I'm sure they would. Yeah. So I don't want my name, my religion, my history to be uh, um, associated with a particular political philosophy. It's my religion. It's it's, and that's all it is. Yeah, are you there, Tom? Yeah, I, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you fine. That's weird. Yeah, Jack, it was funny. Just as you hung up, we could hear you. Oh, you said weird. I'm hanging up. <laughs> yeah, I I did a test call. Yeah, and it was configured okay, so I thought I'd just try again. Yeah, well, it's working fine now, until it Oops. doesn't, you know. Okay. Anyway, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, no, you were going to say something about the, the, the Muslim. You've probably already been there and done that. Now. Well, well, no, but, but I, I want your opinion on it because your take is always interesting. I was going to say, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the reason why they voted on it was because they had interpreted her, some of the things that she was saying as anti-Semitic. And uh, that is, that is the, you know, I mean, certainly the, the, the first comment, the Benjamins, I mean, uh, that kind of thing, but the other thing that he was talking about uh, about uh, APAC at all, you know, as as many people and you probably have, or while I was off fiddling around with my stuff, uh, were mentioning, you know, there's a lot of a lot of Jewish people who are very critical of Israel and definitely and, and don't agree at all with APAC. Yeah. So so the, what I the point what I was going to make and this is interesting because because listening to the different news takes on it was that. Basically, what the Democrats did is they took this resolution, which passed today. Mm. They took the resolution and expanded to include uh, anti-Semitism expressed through white supremacists, anti-Muslim uh, stuff. And, yeah, but don't, and, don't they realize that the reason they're passing that is because of their feeling against this particular Muslim, because she is a Muslim in saying these things? Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and and it's been noted that the uh, West Virginia Republican Party created this this poster of nine you know nine eleven towers burning and this congresswoman you know basically made uh, the you know blaming her for for the for for nine eleven yeah and uh, so but the ironic thing was 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 there were all Democrats in Congress including the the congresswoman herself 
They all voted yes for the resolution. 23 Republicans voted against it. Oh, no. Really? They like hate. They like hate. <laughs> and, and, and so... USA! And so, USA! <laughs> Yeah, they, you know, here are the Republicans going, you don't have the guts to, 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 to vote for this this resolution. And then the 23, and, and it includes, like, you know, that guy, was it Peter Kagan in... Uh, Steve King, yeah. Steve Kagan in, in Iowa. He actually voted present. But all these people, you know, uh, Republicans voted against it. And then I was listening to the Channel 2 News. Yeah. And... They didn't even mention the fact that all the that the old that when he said uh, Frank Somerville said, well, all the Democrats voted for it. He didn't say that the that twenty three votes against it were all Republicans. It's yeah. it's you it, know it, it's sort of ironic that you know that the Republicans were trying to use this resolution to stick it to the Democrats, and they got, got end up getting stuck. Yeah, themselves. but I mean, uh, uh, get to you in a second, Patrick. I mean, I just don't understand why you would. But to begin with, I don't understand why you have to vote on something like this. Isn't yeah. being against hate a given? Okay. Secondly, uh, uh, the fact that there were uh, any number of Republicans who didn't vote for it because they thought it was a Democratic thing, uh, it's stupid. It's just stupid. Yes, Patrick. Is it possible that the Republican that voted against it thought along the same line as Alec Bennett, who thought it was a horseshit resolution anyway. And, and why would I vote for something that is a logical thing? Because I'll tell you right now, more than likely, I would have voted against it too, because I would have looked at it as, isn't this just a normal thing that we don't like hate? Well, and it's, and, and it's grandstanding. Uh, if, if, for everybody who voted for it, it's yeah. grandstanding to say, look how open-minded I am, <laughs> look how inclusive I am, and regardless of the party. That, so I just wonder, Alex, if you were on the floor, if you were oh, I, I would, I, I, to begin with, and then we'll go to Tom, I would vote for it. And I'll tell you why, because uh, in general purpose, of course, I'm not for hate. And as long as it's being presented in front of me, I've got to take I've got to take a position on it. Uh, I you know even though I feel I mean I would first tell everybody I think it's unnecessary because how, you know isn't it a given that hate is wrong and tolerance is good? You know yes, Tom. Well, yeah, and it's totally facetious because that's not the Republican position from the beginning. They were actually the for. Now he froze up on us. Mm. What happened to him? Making oh. these statements, oh. it means that you're you're tolerating anti-Semitism when you have what's again is what Peter King or whatever in yeah. Iowa talking about. Well, what you know? What, why why is why is white supremacy such a bad thing? Suddenly, <laughs> you know, it's like and all the things that you know that Trump has said. I mean. You know, people with with torches marching down the street, uh, saying Jews will not replace us. They're good people. They're good people well, on the other yeah. side. On that side, but on the other hand, I mean, uh, on the, the other hypocrisy, hand, hypocrisy. The hypocrisy yeah. is just astounding. Yeah, but I mean, the the uh, the idiocy is the saying. Well, we're going to do a resolution against hate. Well, come on, isn't that a given? You know, I mean, do we do we really think that people who are racist and uh, all those things are are homophobic are it's it's okay? So we're going to vote against this thing? Come on, you know. But well, I agree with Patrick. I mean, it's unnecessary it's to have the it's that force the issue. It's unnecessary to have the vote in the first place, and it was only done for political purposes. You well, know, sure. it wasn't done because they love Jews and they love blacks and they love homosexuals and they love all the people it's going to protect. They did it because they wanted to stick it to the Republicans and some Republicans went, you ain't going to stick it no, to us. No, they did it. They did it because they were trying to get this this one woman, Congresswoman, who was a Muslim, a Somali refugee. They were trying to uh, silence her. Listen, I got news for you. And then I'll go to Patrick. If she hates Jews, Let's say she honestly hates Jews. 
because of what happened to her in her life, I understand it. Well, I don't does. forgive it. I don't That's say it's okay, but I understand that she, at least there's some reason why. But she doesn't. She's got Jewish constituents. I yeah. know, I know. But, you know, what they're doing, they're going after her because she's Muslim. But really, and then they're passing a law saying, well, we <laughs> shouldn't do anything against Muslims, but they're doing it because she is Muslim. If she wasn't Muslim, and maybe she she made those comments uh, as a white Christian, it might just go, nobody would pay attention to it. Ooh. You know, so it was because she was Muslim, so there's the hatred right there that they're voting against. <laughs> yes, Patrick? Did they include crippled Americans? No, fuck you. No. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Not you know, I mean, and quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of you being able to get those parking spaces right at the front of the supermarket, okay? <laughs> I think that if we cared about you as, as crippy Americans, uh, that we would uh, make you park in the back and have to crawl to the supermarket because that will make you feel a sense of self, uh, 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 self-reliance. Mm. So oh I, I just, I just thought I'd put that in there. And and why should I, if let's say I'm a smoker and I can't walk that far, why do I have to park in the back and I can't get the handicapped? You know what I'm saying? You think you got all the stuff? Hey, I'm a, I'm handicapped. I can park here. Fuck you. Amen. <laughs> And that's my comedy bit for tonight and scene. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is your hand up, Vernon? Yes. Yes. Uh, but I'm, I'm not quite sure why a resolution against the national emergency, Trump gets to veto. It's a resolution. It's not a law. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, but... but the joint, <clears throat> the joint resolutions still have to be signed for by the president <clears throat> concurrent resolutions do not what, what, what's the difference between a concurrent resolution and what they're trying to pass here a, I, a joint resolution is is like a, I'm trying to think of the way to define it uh, a joint resolution is like uh, basically like law so I mean both houses of Congress agree uh, <clears throat> All the wording has to be exact, et cetera, et cetera. And it can go to the executive for uh, mm -hmm. approval or veto. Um, and uh, it, it's basically law, but we wouldn't really. Ref I, th I think when we think of law, we think about, you know, you must stop at the stop sign, okay, right? That's a law. It says stop, you must stop. Yeah. But some laws are not always acts that you can or cannot do. do you, I mean, is, am I explaining that correctly? Yeah. It's, it's, it's more of a directive or not a directive. And a concurrent resolution, I uh, believe, is more... Uh, That's not a good number. Um, more something that they would use if they want to take action that doesn't require the executive signature. So, like... Uh, like if, if they wanted to censure the president, for example, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all remember how uh, President Jed Bartlett was censured in the West Wing. He was censured with a concurrent resolution, not with a joint resolution, because it doesn't require the, the signature of the executive. I see. Okay. All right. So, so, so here, Trump could veto it, but could they then go to the Supreme Court with it if he vetoes yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they can't override his veto, they, they can't I mean, override. If they can override his veto, then uh, <clears throat> you know their version is the law rather than his. But I don't know, you know. And then if he defies that, he's in he's in he's in defiance of a of a federal law. Yeah. In which case they can they have multiple routes. They can choose impeachment, or they can choose uh, <clears throat> the the courts. You know, I mean, they'll have a few, a few options. Yeah. Um, but I'm yeah. not sure about. Right. Uh, well, if uh, if they can't override his veto, then uh, they're right. They're basically right back where they started from. I would think. In which case, there's there's no law either in favor of or against. Uh, they've passed their version and he vetoed, so there is no version to speak of. So he's just back to using what he believes is his powers. In which case, he I gets to he gets he gets to call, he gets to call it emergency. Right, but don't they don't they have a can't they go to the Supreme Court with this thing? I heard that they could. Yeah, they can. Well, sure they can. Yeah, when, when when it gets to that, I mean, I'm sure it'll go to a federal appeals court. You know, first, first uh, 
I mean, I don't think they'll get a direct, uh, direct uh, line to the Supreme Court, you know, uh, unless somebody files for some sort of immediate action by the court and the court agrees to take it up. I mean, the court can do that. They can they can take it up anytime they want. They have pretty broad power. Yeah. But I don't I don't know that they will. They typically like to let the lower courts have their say. Yeah. First, yeah. you know. But I, I I don't know if they'll take it up before that or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. So so in other words, how do we how do we stop this madman from uh, from doing the emergency, the national emergency? To begin with, if it goes to a court, if it goes to the Supreme Court, all they got to do is pull off the tape where he says well i didn't really have to do this but well then i guess yeah, it isn't an emergency so. an emergency would be something that is so pressing that you've got to do it right now am i am i did i get the word emergency wrong yeah yeah i mean that's uh, yeah. he didn't help himself with those statements if you ask me i, I certainly agree with that yeah. I, I mean i don't know uh you know He's not very wise when it comes to things like that. He's just, you know, he doesn't. Uh, statements like that are why uh, p- people wish that they could get him on one side of a table and Robert Mueller on the other, because everyone knows he can't. He, he's not the type of person who can uh, who can shut up. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I hate to use another uh, 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 tidbit from uh, that that old show, The West Wing, again, but I remember one on there where a lawyer says, "Do you know what time it is?" and the person says, "Yeah, it's." 312 and he's like you got to stop doing that on the witness stand if someone says do you know what time it is you say yes stop volunteering more information than you were asked to give and he's the type of person that can't shut up can't so, shut up yeah yeah, yeah. uh yes uh vernon uh shoot i was just wondering if if uh if i'm misreading it but i think several states have already filed suit about the national emergency haven't well, they? well that too that's another court? yeah right yeah, yeah uh, uh, far as I know, right. They're just probably getting the ball rolling because I believe a few of those, probably a couple border states, right, like California or something yeah. along those lines. Well, could could they just that would have that would have some legitimate standing to argue standing. You know, they right. they have uh, suffered some sort of you know uh, injury as a result of the national emergency. Could we pass maybe a resolution? Is this possible? Uh, uh, making the president not waste our money any longer? Because, I mean, it, first of all, he wasted our money when he took all those National Guard troops and made them go down to the border for, like, what, 30 days or 45 days or something. Right, then, they're still there, aren't they? Didn't he waste our money just in jet fuel going to Hanoi? You know, uh, uh, you know, he wastes our money all the time. This is another th- place he's wasting money because now all these suits are going to fly back and forth. It's going to cost us a fortune. Yes, uh, t- uh, yes, uh, Patrick. Uh, Wisconsin pulled all their National Guard troops out. So did California, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, n- n- no more, no more wall guarding. You know, I mean, this whole thing is it, it's all, all this stuff is costing us money. I mean, this president is going to make the national debt get worse and worse and worse because of all the money, all the money we're losing in trade. I mean, it's just, it's getting insane. He, he, you know, I heard that this week, Alex, that the national trade deficits ballooned in the last two months. Yeah. Where this was supposed to make it go down, right? Right. Yeah. Yes, to, uh, Charlie. Yeah, the trade deficit is actually the biggest it's ever been in U.S. history. Oh. Thanks to Trump. Well, it certainly worked. Yes, Rob. So the states that have are have filed the lawsuit against uh, Trump's emergency plan are California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, uh, Attorney General Dana Nessen on behalf of the people of Michigan, the state of Minnesota, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, and Virginia. Wow. <laughs> ah. it, it, Jeff, did you have your hand up? Like, uh, turn on your mic. Hey, what? Yeah. Um, sorry. What? 
what I'm, I can't believe that Trump keeps talking about this bullshit that that he's not doing all the time, which is the the wall crap. All and there's all these people who believe him. <laughs> I go, how fucking dumb. It's a is cult. It? It's a I cult. I guess it. It's like. It's not critical thinking. That's well, at what point, my question is, at what point are the Republicans going to start bailing on Trump? In other words, <laughs> when is it going to not be to their best advantage to, to side with this guy? When it's going to hurt them politically. Uh, hasn't it already, do you think? No, I don't think so. Uh, I'm <laughs> thinking that, uh, you know, Republicans only represent i think what is it 35 percent of the electorate yeah. and and democrats something like 43 44 somewhere around there i may be wrong but i think i'm close enough and then mm -hmm. the rest of course are in the middle and so there's this this whole ground of, of people who will shift back and forth do you think there's a shift towards trump rather than away from trump or do you think there's a tr shift away from him Hard to know. I mean, you got to remember, he was three million votes shy of winning the election by the popular vote. So we're already ahead by three million. We just got to get him in the right place. That's all, you know. Then why do then why do people think that Trump's going to get a second term? Well, because we're looking at who's going to run against him, and it ain't exactly a uh, uh, it, it, it isn't exactly a great bunch. Uh, uh, let me see here. Did, Jeff, did you have something to say? or? I, no, I uh, wouldn't talk. Okay, Patrick. The, the biggest thing that the Democrats need is somebody that can be as bombastic and as um, <coughs> hard edge and gritty as Trump is. It, and is willing to, just like that vote that happened today about the hate, willing to forego the grandstanding of being the angelic party and the party of we're going to be nice and all of that, and be willing to get down into the mud and the blood and all of the dirt with Trump and fight it out. And right now, from my perspective, and everybody knows how much I love Trump, I don't see anybody even close to having the ball to go again, Tim. Um, In other words, you're saying you're saying what you're what you're essentially saying is there's nobody willing to fight as dirty as Trump. Right, and that's the only way you're going to beat him. You have to at least meet him at his level, and then you know it, it turns stomachs of a lot of Democrats who don't like that. Yeah, and I can think of one person on this panel that. Doesn't like fighting and all of that, Tom. Uh, <laughs> in in essence, if you had a Democrat that then came out and was as just the same personality and was able to beat Trump, I bet Tom would vote for them in a heartbeat. Yeah, but you know what the problem is with you know? I mean, when you say I'm going to be civil, all right? I'm not going to go down in the mud with Trump. Well, the fact of the matter is that he'll beat the shit out of you. Because yeah. that's exactly what the problem He's was. With, what, what, that was the problem with Hillary. Hillary wouldn't get down to that level. What she should have done. You know how she could have won that election? The time they were doing the the uh, the, uh, the debate, and he was circling around behind her time? like a shark. Yeah. At, at, at she said that she really wanted to turn around and, and uh, say to him, "Back off, creep." If she had said, "Back off, creep," she'd be president today. I agree. Okay. You know, hundred percent. People are afraid of him. Why? And, and the biggest problem is, I'll, I'll tell you in one second. The, the people who are the most uh, afraid of him are the Republicans, his own party. And I and I think it is because Trump is a bully. He's a street guy, and and you know, and he's got a big mouth, and he'll say anything. Yeah. And he's willing to lie every day. It doesn't bother him yeah. at all. Vernon, and they're I, afraid of that kind of stuff. Vernon, yeah, it. Vernon, I saw your hand up. 
Yeah, I kind of disagree with Patrick about the way to beat Trump because uh, my great grandmother told me one time that if you wallow in the in the mud with pigs, you're going to lose because the pigs will enjoy it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, are she sure the pigs would enjoy it? Yeah, uh, this is politics. Unfortunately, yeah. pigs are very intelligent, and I think some of them have more mm. brains than Trump. Uh, let's see, two hands went up at the same time, so uh, uh, Patrick first. I would just say this to Vernon. Um, um, <clears throat> if Trump gets another term because nobody wanted to wallow in the mud with him, then I guess everybody knows what the strategy is going to be for 2024 because you're going to end up with another Republican running that's probably similar to Trump. Because if the Republicans see that that's the way to win, they're probably going to dig up somebody else that's of the same mentality. My question is, uh, here we've got, we're beginning to see the, the uh, field. Uh, and God knows it's going to be a huge field. I mean, they're going to have to hold two debates in the beginning for every debate because there are too many people, all right? My question is, of all those people, do you see anybody who has a shot at beating Trump? Tom, don't, don't say Bernie Sanders, please. No, I'm going to say the key word to what you said is the beginning. And the, 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 the issue, the, the problem is we are only at the beginning. We don't know, it, it, you know, this time next year, who's going to come out top and who's going to be. And, and the candidate may be someone who hasn't even declared yet. We don't know. But, and so it's, it's sort of foolish from my point of view to even make any speculation as to, you know, uh, who is going, who, who's going to have the best uh, shot against, against Trump. We know this one thing, and that is, you know, that, that, uh, that, we, that, that uh, the, we know who Trump is, and I think that the Democrats are definitely going are, are going to make the same mistake that they made in 2016. Right. They're going to realize how how bad the stakes are, and they're going to be more unified than they were in 2016. The reason uh, that Trump won is not it is it was basically because of voter su suppression, and and that includes the people discouraged. They didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton. I want to get into the details as to Look, uh, how good bad a candidate. That's just the reality. It, it was a matter of less than 80,000 votes in, in three states. Yep. And, you know, Patrick State's one being one of them. And look what happened in in uh, in November this past year. I mean, uh, Patrick's beloved governor, uh, Scott Walker, got, got his, you know, got his walking papers. Okay, let, let, so, let, yeah. Let me just. So, so that, that's yeah. too early to tell. Let me just throw out some names here, and just people go yes or no. Uh, Joe Biden. No. Yeah, that's the only guy that I feel like really they should run against Trump personally. Okay. I think he'll. I think, he'll, I think personally, Biden is yesterday's news. The Democratic Party is going a different way. The younger people are not going to get excited about him. How about Bernie Sanders? No. He's drawing crowds. He may be drawing crowds, but, you know. Um, He's also raised the most money so far. Yeah. Uh, but is that a sign that he can win? You know, I mean, he, he when I first saw, let me put, go back years ago, uh, uh, Oprah said she liked a guy in Chicago. She thought he should be president. And his name was Barack Obama. And as soon as she said that, I said, where is he running? <laughs> because Oprah said she liked him. Uh, I then saw Barack Obama, and he got the idea to run for president because she suggested it. All right? No, no, he, was no he, he was running for president in 2000, 2004 when he made the keynote speech at, at the Democratic Convention. Do you, you think it's... Groomed. He was being groomed for, for the... Well, that is a key spot, by the way, because that's the one Kennedy had... Uh, before he ran for president, was giving the keynote speech at the Republican convention for Stevenson, I think. Uh, but anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, so uh, I thought that, oh, I looked at Obama and I said, this, is, this guy can win. 
And the reason I said he could win is because there were certain, it has nothing to do with is, are his politics good or is he a, this or is he a that. I looked at him, he was good looking, gave a great speech, you know, uh, was very charismatic that way. And I saw him as the perfect stealth candidate. Sure enough, he won. You know, there, as a candidate, you couldn't, you couldn't get anybody more perfect. And that's what the Democrats need now. And none of these people have that quality. You know, uh, and, and, and it has to also, I think, be somebody who nobody really knows who they are, like they didn't know who Obama was. Mm -hmm. Because when you don't know who somebody is, you can't exactly be against them. Yes, Tom. Have you heard of Jay Inslee? No. Yeah. No. No. Jay Inslee is the current <laughs> governor of Washington. Oh, okay. Yes. Not, yes, I do. He's the current. He's 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 been in Congress twice. He was the first time he was elected to Congress. Yeah. He got defeated after one term because he voted for the assault rifle ban. Hmm. Okay, he's my guy. He's my guy. And he ran for state legislature yeah. and won. Wait a minute. Let me he ask you another question. Again and won. How does he look on television? I think he looks pretty good. You know, because there's a, there's there is a charisma factor, and let's not even deny that for a moment. You know, we uh, charisma plays a large part in the election of somebody. Now you're saying, what kind of charisma did Trump have? Well, I guess to a trailer camp, that is charisma. Well, he was he on also... one of the talk shows recently. He was on one of the talk shows recently, and somebody was saying, how do you think you can win being a single-issue candidate? And his single issue is climate change. And he said, look, it's not a single issue. Climate change affects everything. It affects our military. It affects our economy. You know, climate change. Can you convince? Can you convince the American public of that, though? Yeah, people don't know that problem. <laughs> you know, uh, it, 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 uh, weather is is something that if it, it's not weather. It, yeah, people <laughs> confused weather and climate. Yeah, but, cold weather doesn't mean the climate isn't changing. Right, but you, how do you how do you convince people, people that this is an issue? That's the point. And I don't know that you can. I don't think that's the kind of issue they get behind. They get behind the that's simple sad. ones. They, they get behind the ones where you create a terror, like, oh, the Mexicans are coming, you know? Uh, and then you get everybody, and then you supply the solution. I'm going to build a wall. Yes, so Patrick. Silly. Patrick. If somebody, if somebody told me that that was their platform, mm. there's no way I'd vote for him. Well, you always <laughs> vote for him anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Because, and it wouldn't, what I'm saying is, if it was a Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Because uh, I, don't, I don't see it as, as an issue. Mm -hmm. And if somebody threw that at me, I'd laugh at him and say, okay, but what are you really going to run on? Well, After what, the what, winter you went through? <laughs> what? what? After the winter you went through, you still don't know that climate change is the problem? No, but it's a fucking cold. I, I'm waiting for the global warming to happen, and it's not. No. Not global warming. Climate, climate change, change doesn't just make the planet. One, one night, one night talking about weather. Patrick, about one weather, night you and I will have climate. to have this conversation when I've got more time, and we will have to talk about it from the standpoint of if you've got global warming, it doesn't mean everything's hot. Right. <laughs> That's or, yeah. not... That's right. not what it means. But anyway, listen, I, 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 but I love your position. I don't respect it, but I love your position. Uh, uh, you know, and I, I, one of my favorite people, what am I going to say outside of the fact that you should have to walk to the supermarket? Anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Jeff, for being with us tonight. I also want to thank Josh for being with us and giving us all the legal information we need to know. Rob? Terrific. Patrick, love you, pal. You're not mad at me, are you? Huh? <laughs> Tell me you're not mad at me. I don't want Patrick mad at me. How's that? Uh, okay. 
Okay, anyway, uh, Charles, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And uh, Tom, always a pleasure. Vernon Nunn, great having you here. Everybody, give a big wave goodbye to everybody out there. And we'll see you again, hopefully, tomorrow night. Bye-bye. Anyway, that's it for tonight. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I, next is the intersection, Jack Bishop, tomorrow night. Uh, when it becomes uh, 9.30, it will be Damien Chaplin and uh, a wonderful little program called The uh, Exchange. And then tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, same time, same station in life, it shall be me once again. And in the meantime, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye. <laughs>